Hi, Mark, and hi, Gloria. Thanks so much for joining me today on this last panel of the Skoll World Forum. Um, so this whole forum has been about closing the distance. And I think for this conversation, what I'm hoping to get out of it is really looking for how we can think about after a year of, of protests and, and reckonings over for racism, over uh, climate, over just, you know, reckoning with the inequalities in, in our world. Um, I'm hoping that this conversation can help us think about, in some ways, how we move from reckoning um, and confrontation to justice and to rectification. So with that, um, I actually want to start off uh, with you, Gloria. And um, in reading about your work, you, you've called yourself a solutionary and that you're committed to radical inclusion. And in the wake of the turmoil of the last year, the protests over, over racism, this uh, horrific pandemic, I'm curious, has your thinking about radical inclusion changed? And can you walk us through that? Yeah. Um... So I'm really glad to be here, Karen, and really grateful to share space with you again, Mark. The first thing that's coming to mind is, you know, definitely thinking that we're living in a time where our country and our world is calling for us to do better. And you mentioned the George Floyd protests, which really are, you know, protests in general are like a basis for momentum um, to really spur change. And in this case, we witness a Black man losing his life. And um, the reality is that many have lost their lives uh, to gun violence, you know, by people in uniform um, and slow deaths that are also happening in our environmental justice communities. And so people are literally fighting for their lives. And, you know, the, the painful words, and um, I have to try not to get emotional when I think about them, but to, to, to hear, please, I can't breathe, um, my stomach hurts, uh, my neck hurts, everything hurts. And for a country and people of color across the world to gravitate towards those words and really um, feel that it was, it was a frame that captured their experience. Uh, tells us so much about the times that we're living in. And you mentioned COVID, right? And COVID for me is really illuminating how well we're either taking care of each other or not, <laughs> and who we're willing to sacrifice or protect. And it's organizations like the Solutions Project Funds, grassroots climate organizations across this country and organizations that are doing power building, leadership development, and community organizing that are really um, the backbone and those that are providing mutual aid and COVID support and responding to multiple problems um, in ways that are having solutions that are actually addressing multiple problems at once from racism to income inequality to environmental degradation. And so it really is Black, Indigenous, immigrant, people of color, women. You know, it's probably no surprise that women are really leading uh, this country during this time. And that's who we fund at the Solutions Project. We really believe that it's necessary to fund grassroots, climate-based community organizations. And we're an, a national intermediary. And so what that really means is, you know, we are kind of like the liaison between a lot of grassroots organizations and kind of high net worth individuals, big funders, uh, businesses, um, industry leaders, which are spaces that grassroots leaders often don't have access to. And so I find myself in a place of privilege leading this organization and actually coming from 16 years of community organizing work. I used to run a grassroots organization. So I'm able to come into this work with a huge vantage point and so we believe that we have to shine a light on all the work that's happening on the ground. And, you know, it's celebrities like Mark and many others who have partnered with us. Mark is a founder of our organization and they really lend their platform to elevate leaders and shine a spotlight on grassroots organizations and communities across this country that are affecting change. And we believe that it's these leaders that are innovating and, and really showing us 
what's possible when it comes to an affordable, clean energy economy. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm thinking about like that latter part of your question about how to move from um, the reckoning to the rectification. And so it really, I guess, is about acknowledging the harm that's been done since the founding of this country, um, whether it's been on indigenous folks, other communities of color, black people. Um, you can think about sovereign nations and the attack that has happened there. Uh, we can go to slavery to, um, you know, reconstruction to Jim Crow. Um, and the residue of all of that still exists today. And so what we're fighting for and what communities on the ground see is that climate is an opportunity to create a new economy that doesn't have the same income, income inequality and racism and sexism uh, that exists in today's society. You know, fantastic. I, 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 I love that you said that, that it is, we're in a moment where people are voicing the harm um, and the power even just of, of that. Uh, Mark, I wanted to turn to you to sort of piggyback off of what um, Glory has said. You know, you've you've gotten into you've been in, in climate activism uh, for years now, the fight against fracking in New York, and you've been quoted as as saying firsthand that these uh, arenas for for change and in the world of environmentalism and philanthropy is very white, is very male dominated. Tell us a little bit of, of, of what it's been, frankly, you know, as a powerful white man uh, with a platform to be involved uh, with grassroots efforts. Um, yeah, I, I, I did have the privilege of, of coming uh, to this work from um, a place where, uh, as a frontline community member myself. And um, what I did see was who was leading this movement, uh, really hardcore organizing in the trenches were the women. Um, and uh, they, they still are. Uh, and that was that was started for me 10 years ago. Uh, it's, it's not surprising uh, and no one who is really in the movement will, will refute that. But the, when you get into the, the actual organizations, it is uh, white male dominated. Um, and it is very old school and it is oppressive and it is not uh, generally open to um, new ways of approaching uh, these issues. And by the way, I don't, I would even say not even that effective. Uh, and so, you know, what I, what I've, my journey has been, um, and I think it's all of our journeys. I mean, we're we're in this moment of um, I like to say revelations, not not in the not in the sense in the biblical sense, but in the sense that we're seeing the reality of America and and the racism, sexism, misogynism, the violence that that is built into the very DNA of our country. And so, almost every uh, organism, not every. Um, I don't want to say every organization, but um, all of the all of the uh, structure of it, e even when you get into the organizations, is this kind of white dominated thing, and 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 people have been blind to it, and I think we're we can't be blind to it anymore, and so the conversations I'm having are. Uh, Listen, I've always been kind of a radical. I, I was kicked out of all those places. But I would say for any man uh, in, in, your, in, in an environmental organization, here I am going on and on. But uh, any man, it's you have to listen. I mean, we have to be uncomfortable to make change happen. That's the only way we're going to make change happen. And that's allowing ourselves to be uncomfortable, especially as white males. And, and the privilege that we've held for you know 244 years in this country. It, you know, it, it, it's going to take some listening, being uncomfortable, and allowing relationship to carry us through. And the one thing that I did know, I do notice about female le leadership is it, it, it operates in a totally different way. It's 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 much. It's not really top down. It's more of a community approach, and and that's how I see how things get done. You know that that's where I see that that's why we won the fracking uh, fight in New York State was because it was the f women who were who were running the strategy and the organizing. So, 
water and infrastructure issues have been in the news um, in the U.S. over the last few months. Um, I'm joining you guys here from Texas, where we went through a massive uh, power outage failure, which caused millions of people in the state to go without power and water for weeks. But um, the same thing happened in Mississippi, and specifically in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, where the coverage and the stories that we had around Jackson were quite different. Um, Gloria, do you want to, you know, give us your thoughts and insights into how uh, water and, and infrastructure and the, again, the stories that the media tells about these things, how you see these stories being different out of Mississippi versus what we saw in Texas? Yeah, I'm actually appreciating this question, Karen. I'm uh, I have family in Texas, <laughs> also in in Houston, and I'm actually originally from Mississippi, which is where my mom and sister and nieces and nephews live. Um, and you're absolutely right. When the ice storm, you know, as my family calls it, it was an ice storm because everything literally froze. When it happened, yes, it it hit Texas hard, and it also hit Mississippi really hard. And um, I'll share a little bit of the story from Mississippi because this is like part of the story that a lot of people didn't hear much about. Um, but the same duration of time, you know, Mississippi was in havoc, just like Texas. And the infrastructure there, the water infrastructure in particular, is older. And so it took a long time just for them to get water again. And so my family was also one of the families that people probably read about that was sleeping in the car um, just to stay warm because, you know, my niece and nephew, these are children um, and didn't have, you know, couldn't cook and didn't have food. And so I was able to call grassroots organizations in Jackson who were able to deliver food to my family and many other families who couldn't cook and also delivered water um, because they were without water for nearly three weeks. Like it was pretty wild. And um, it was my mom who called and was just like, oh my God, uh, they're not talking about Mississippi. Why aren't they talking about Mississippi? We need help, you know, President Biden needs to know. Um, and then she was also the one who called kind of a, a few weeks into their experience where she was like, oh, Gloria, we're on CNN. You know, someone was on CNN and oh, they talked about us on The View. Right. And, and so these were the things that actually mattered for my mother because she said, OK, now they're hearing our story. And the first thing that she felt was that they're not talking about Mississippi and Jackson in particular because it's predominantly black. And that was what her experience was and probably the experience of a lot of people. And so there are racial undertones to this you know, that we never want to name. These are always things that are difficult to talk about and uncomfortable to talk about. Um, but at the Solutions Project, every year um, for the past three years, we've compiled a report about kind of clean energy coverage in the U.S., particularly how race, uh, gender, and equity play out. And in 2019, we found that less than 5% of U.S. clean energy coverage even references communities of color. Yet we know that that's where most of the problems are happening, as well as the innovative solutions. And so across the board, one of the things that we're seeing is that the status quo way needs to be disrupted. Whether you're looking at media and how we, who and what we cover, cover and, and how we cover stories, that needs to be disrupted um, in an equitable way. When you're looking at philanthropy, you know, that story needs to be disrupted. The way philanthropy has been investing dollars is actually, um, it looks like racism, right? And so when you, I always think that a budget and how you invest your dollars tells a story. And the story that it was telling is that we do not value BIPOC and women of color leadership. And why was it telling that story? Because for years, these are the communities and organizations that have been historically disinvested and underinvested in for years. Yet we're in a moment where everyone's talking about equity. And what equity really is about, I often say leveling the playing field, but I'm going to push it a little further today. But I say leveling the playing field because if you're recognizing that these are places and spaces and leaders that have been historically under and disinvested in, then this is a time where if it's about equity, you got to over invest if there's even such a thing in these places, spaces and leaders. You know, it's like you grow up and you often think that everything's coincidental, but really 
the same environmental justice communities of today are the same red line communities from way back when. It's the same narrative. And that's why things need to change. And people are saying we have to wake up to that reality. And it's not even just about leveling the playing field. We have to create a new playing field. Mm -hmm. And that's why people are taking to the streets. In an environmental organization culture that is mostly run by white guys, to, to have Gloria come in and, and tell us those stories and frame it that way was something I never would have done on my own, never in a million years. And by the way, it made people uncomfortable. We lost people because of it, you know? And, 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 and it's challenging. It was challenging as, as a founder of this organization to, 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 to be called out in that way. It was uncomfortable. But man, I am so grateful now that it happened. And I'm so grateful that Gloria is leading us and you understand why. And this is a transformation that I think we need to make. And it makes us bigger. It makes us better. It makes us more human. We lost people. And as far as those, we've also been able to raise a significant amount of money with this message by letting funders know and high net worth individuals know that if you're really trying to be about equity, then let's do this right. This is an opportunity to disrupt status quo philanthropy, which is saying to fund commensurate with an organization's previous year's budget. And that keeps people where they're at. One thing that, uh, you know, the two of you, you know, speaking with me, a member of the media, um, and I, I just think about, again, the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves and about the problems that we have and the solutions that we have. So I'm curious and I'm kicking this out to either of you. Um, I would say that the mainstream media, we can be great at, at protests, we can be great at covering confrontations, but not always so great at covering movements at, you know, once the cameras move on, what is happening to those communities. And so I'm curious about what you think, what advice you would have even for, for journalists who, uh, what must the media do to help be a part of the change? How should we change what we are doing and how we talk about uh, these issues, particularly on climate? So a couple of things. Uh, yes, I think media, just like the role of government, just like our community organizations, just like our industry leaders, media has a critical role to play. And often all of us are influenced by the public debate which media often frames. <laughs> and so um, media has an opportunity to elevate the stories of grassroots cl climate organizations across this country um, and the stories from their perspective, you know, talking about the problems and conditions from their vantage point and talking about the innovative ways they address solutions, solutions that are addressing multiple problems. You know, often in our communities, it's not just about putting a solar panel on a building, but, you know, you put a solar panel on a building, you're also planting trees because these are communities that are highly concretized and, and don't have much green space. You're also thinking about who is going to be the person putting this, installing the solar panel on, you know, this affordable housing unit, for example. And, and the other part is like thinking about how we um, grassroots organizations are often looking at a problem multifold. Why? Because they often say, you know, we live at the intersection of many issues. And so even though people are leading on climate um, and really trying to accelerate a clean energy economy, it doesn't just begin with putting a solar panel. Like they're like, okay, build affordable housing because we have homelessness in our communities and income inequality. And also let's put a solar panel on, on this affordable housing uh, because we know that we that fossil fuel industries is the old way. And so we're trying to move towards the new way. And let's try to make sure that whoever's putting this solar panel on this building is a person from this community, someone who's been disproportionately impacted by climate degradation. Um, and making sure that they're in a training program, um, that they get a unionized job, right? So they're thinking about multiple ways to address the myriad of problems <laughs> that they're living with. Uh, so it's just not a, it's not one solution, but it's a scale of solutions that often happen in these communities. And that's what media should be covering. 
Mm -hmm. And Mark, I mean, to, to sort of expand on this theme of, of the stories that we tell ourselves, you know, you as, as being a part of Hollywood, even, I'm curious about what you think Hollywood should be doing uh, more of in, in terms of, you know, not just, you know, individual uh, uh, actors, celebrities, you know, taking up their own causes, but um, how can Hollywood produce more uh, stories that help us imagine a different world, a different way of being. What, what do you think? Um, there's a lot we can do. I mean, you know, there's a lot that actors can do with their platform, and we and you know we have a responsibility with with what we do with this with this privilege and this reach. You know, so th there's that, and and I have seen so much more activation in the last three years than I than I have, or four years than I than I have in ten years on, on that level. I mean, people are really finding their voices. Um, you know, I used to think that you could you could make a uh, a piece of art that would change the world. Um, now, I believe that the culture, the world, has got is calls that piece of art forward. Um, there has to be a kind of listening, uh, um, a readiness um, in the people and and their thought and their understanding. Um, for a, a piece of work to to really have significance um, in, in, a, in a particular moment in time, either political, culturally, socially. Um, and we're at that place with with climate change. I see it happening. I'm, I'm getting scripts that are directly talking about these issues and how they're related. And until we until we talk about them in their relationship, We'll never really be able to solve these problems. We'll never really be able to understand. And, and then, lastly, you know what? These st our stories are what connect us. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or 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 where you come from. It's our story. You tell the stories of people, and and everyone relates to them in the same way. And 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 we don't tell enough of the stories about the people that we need to be hearing from right now. So when we see George Floyd, or we're watching the, the trial right now, we're hearing the stories of people and we see ourselves in all of them. Whether you're talking about opioid addictions or poverty or class or just the human decency of seeing a man dying and, and wanting to do something for him, no matter who you are or where you come from. And those that's what we believe that at, at the Solutions Project, it's why we're telling stories, it's why, we, why we're lifting up the voices that we are, because we believe in the power of, narr of a narrative storytelling to actually really touch people and change the hearts and minds of people in real time. Perfect. All right, I'm afraid we are out of time. We could talk for hours and hours about these things, but Mark, Gloria, thank you so much uh, for joining and for, and for sharing your insights and, and for your leadership in, in this space. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, thank Karen. You.